that you remember best about it? That's been a long time ago, of course. Father died in 1926. I was a uh, senior in high school and uh, had were due to graduate in the January 1927, so it was a very traumatic experience at that age. However, he had been ill for a long time, and uh, uh, his father was a great worker. He was a hard worker. He was 68 at the time of his death. But he um, had the wonderful opportunity uh, during his lifetime to be associated with uh, great people. He was essentially a builder. He was a, a carpenter and a mechanic and a bricklayer and a stonemason and uh, was raised under pioneer influences and in times in St. George uh, after they came from England uh, when he was only five years of age. And uh, it was interesting to note that uh, in the journey that took place coming across from New York down to Missouri, uh, St. Louis and then across the plains. He said, uh, I was only five, but I can uh, well remember that I rode very little. I walked most of the way into the Salt Lake Valley. And subsequently, they were sent down into uh, uh, St. George to colonize his, his father and family. And uh, there it was that he, he grew up uh, to young manhood. And then after his mother died, why, uh, there was some difficulty uh, with the stepmother, and uh, that resulted eventually in his leaving home at about uh, 17, 17 and a half, and going down into the Arizona, Arizona Territory to work. And, uh, and that's, of course, where he met my mother, who was a worker for the, uh, and cooking for the uh, railroad. Uh, that was building through that country. And it's interesting to note that um, uh, his experiences uh, had prepared him well to be a pioneer in that area. I remember Father as a, a not a large individual. He was only about 5'8", but uh, a powerful build. Uh, I can recall very well, for instance, uh, he had a job delivering for a big drug company in San Diego. And uh, at that time, I can remember uh, going around with him as just a small uh, boy and uh, see him lift barrels full of stuff off that low bed truck, that, uh, that uh, horse and wagon, wagon drawn uh, dray, they called him in those days. And uh, he would lift barrels that would weigh 250 pounds with, uh, without any great difficulty whatsoever. He was only five foot eight. Yeah, five foot eight. Well, uh, the, the image of the leverage uh, yeah, was necessary. That's, that's, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he became very ill uh, at that time. He'd had some uh, um, bowel trouble, and uh, and they had done uh, done a resection of the bowel, but it uh, and uh, it wasn't uh, as successful as it might be. So when they took him back into the hospital to do some further work on it, why he never returned. But interestingly enough, uh, when he went to the hospital, he turned to me and mother. He and I and mother were there, and mother and I. And he turned to me and said, "I'll never come back." And then shortly after that, why uh, I was at home, I uh, had come home from school, and and uh, it was made known in a very spiritual way. The father died. You, I remember you telling us about your dad as a, a fiddle player. Oh, he was a great musician. Dad could play any instrument he ever picked up. He was a banjo. Uh, essentially, he was a banjo player, uh -huh. and uh, he uh, he played a, a six-string banjo, which is very unusual. Was he self-taught? And self-taught. Uh, he also could play the, the fiddle. And uh, when he was a young man in the, in the Arizona area, he would. Uh, very often come home from, he, at the time he was running a lime kiln, burning lime for a building. 
and uh, the older boys were working with him and he would come home from there and he would uh, eat a little dinner and jump on his horse and ride 50 or 60 miles <laughs> to play all night for a dance. Yeah. And he played the banjo and the fiddle and the mouth organ, mm -hmm. and that was the band for the dance. And then he would also call sometimes, call uh, at the same time he would play and call the, the square dance uh, figures. How did, and, uh, how, did his, uh, how did his wife uh, care for that, uh, <laughs> that journey that he would take or that uh, involvement? Uh, it was difficult, but any time you could make a buck in those days, uh, you took it. And uh, with a family of, uh, at that time then, of uh, actually at that time there was uh, 15 at home children. And uh, older brothers and sisters, of course. And uh, father would, um, mother, of course, uh, had a, a small farm and uh, a house uh, in uh, Thatcher, Arizona. Uh, they had gone, she and her sister and her, her husband, uh, uh, Woods, uh, had gone from Thatcher to drive a buckboard up to the temple at uh, St. George. And uh, believe me, that was a trip in those days. <laughs> and they drove it there, the four of them, up and stayed in the uh, <coughs> St. George area for a while because he had family yet there. And uh, then had driven back, but he had some marvelous things. Now, when they first went down into the Arizona Territory, uh, to settle there just after their marriage when they uh, came back from uh, from St. George, Geronimo was still active in that area. And uh, just ahead of them, uh, less than a day, uh, he had uh, killed several settlers uh, that were coming down into that area. And uh, they didn't know about it at the time, but they went over the same road and down into the Thatcher and Salmonville area in southeastern Arizona where they of course settled. They were right on the Gila River and father had built a little uh, house, lean-to, and willow roof and sod roof and uh, that's where mother had her first child and he was gone out to the out to work and uh, mother was in bed and the, and the river rose and uh, came up about uh, six or eight inches on the mud floor of the uh, cabin and uh, she, of course, got real excited uh, there in bed by herself with a, a new baby. And uh, finally, Dad, Father came home, and uh, and she uh, she was uh, kind of yelling at that time because a couple of big old uh, red racers were climbing up the wall and up into the thatch roof, and she didn't <laughs> like that too well. And he said, well, no, Mandy, don't worry about it. That's a hard pan floor, and the, uh, the water may be come up a couple more inches, but your bed won't sink. <laughs> <laughs> she, she didn't care for Indians too much. <laughs> Not too well, but then, interestingly enough, she, they followed the advice of Brigham Young when he settled into the uh, Salt Lake area. He said it's a lot easier to feed them than fight them. And there was hardly in those days a day would go by that they would have the indigent Indian people come by and beg something to eat. But they always fed them. They always had. I can remember as a child, as an example, with a big family, I can remember mother uh, baking 16 loaves of bread at a time. And that probably was about every four or five days. And we would have, uh, even at that time, in San Diego. Then we subsequently moved to San Diego. Father had been disappointed in a, in a building project. He'd built a big um, uh, siphon underneath the uh, dry river there to carry the water into the area and the government, the uh, county rather, was supposed to cover it with teams of horses and cover it with soil so, and wet it down all the time so it wouldn't crack. Well they didn't do it and so it cracked and um, uh, Dad had to stand, stand all of that expense, oh, and it uh, wiped him out financially. It cost him right around $100,000 eventually, and that's quite a bit of money oh, in the last days. In, in, uh, in, this this uh, would have been yeah. probably what? Mm -hmm. That would have been about, um, uh, see, I was born there in 1908, uh -huh. and so uh, that would have been, uh, I was about uh, 
five, I think, when we came to San Diego. So that would have been 13. 12 or 13, yeah, I moved yeah. to San Diego and uh, settled in the southern southeastern portion of the town, which was called at that time Choya Heights because it was close to the Mexican border. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he uh, came in there, incidentally, most interesting, uh, with all those children, without a dime in his pocket, literally. Mm -hmm. He'd gone over first and uh, mother followed and uh, with the rest of the family and uh, dad uh, walked so he saw this house for rent and uh, he went to the owner and said i'd like to rent your house and he said oh that's fine a big quite a big place quite a good sized place and uh, dad said but i don't have any money <laughs> and uh, he talked to him for a little while and said um, he said, but I, I'm, I'm a worker, and I've got a good trade, and I'm a builder, and I'll, I'll pay you as soon as I get settled. And the man looked at him and sized him up and down and said, you can have it. <laughs> so he uh, rented him the house, and Dad uh, then went down to the, the market and told the same story to the <laughs> owner of the market, and he sized him up and said, I'll give you one month free food. Mm. Not free, but I'll charge it. And, yeah. uh, they did, and so that's the way they became settled in San Diego. And it wasn't long, just a few days, until he was working as a bricklayer, mm -hmm. uh, building there, which he continued to do almost all of his life, building. Uh, he uh, was up in the coastal area around La Jolla and built a lot of the commercial buildings up in that way. And uh, he was a good provider. He, uh, I can remember, interestingly enough, about the time he was working there when I was just a young fellow, Dad would come home at the end of the week and um, uh, have his pay in his hand. And I can just still see that just as clearly as anything in the world. He would walk over to Mother and drop these $20 gold pieces into her hand, <laughs> three $20 gold pieces uh -huh. for the household expense. For, uh, <laughs> for the week. For the week. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that was that was pretty good money in those days, way back then. And when you when you moved from Thatcher, mm -hmm. then you were a young man. You were yes, 11, oh, a, yeah. 12. Uh, no, I wasn't really that old. I was only around five. Oh, okay. And yeah. so and mm -hmm. so your older brothers. Now your oldest brother was With, uh, Dan. Dan? Okay. Yeah. And Dan would have been about twenty-five. Yes, and he he was married then. He just remember about that time he was married to. Now, uh, uh, you guys. Mm -hmm. And my my two older sisters were married. Uh, um, and you, you Blanche and um, Dora, the, and Dora. Yeah. No, Dora didn't get married till later. That okay. was in San Diego. Oh, okay. Um, Blanche and oh, I, know, <laughs> I don't remember the name. But, but, but anyway, they were older sisters. And then interesting, and did, did they come to? You? They come to? No, them? they didn't come. Okay. They, they stayed in Arizona. All right. Uh, Leah also came out, but then she was married in San Diego, then she went back to the valley. Uh -huh. And uh, she divorced that first husband and then was remarried and stayed in the valley until her death. Uh, well, she died up in Phoenix. But anyway, uh, my two older brothers, or my, yeah, my two older brothers, um, uh, Heber and Leif, uh, drove Dad's great big team out with a big wagon, big work wagon clear from uh, the valley out to San Diego. Beautiful pair of uh, work horses. Oh, was that from Thatcher or from Mesa? Uh, Thatcher. Thatcher. Yeah, okay. from Thatcher. So Thatcher, that's clear to San Diego. And that's several that's hundred gotta miles. That's got to be close to 500. And they brought a friend with him, a uh, close friend also, to kind of help out. Uh, wasn't a cousin really, but he was like a cousin. And uh, they ran out of food. Oh. <laughs> and uh, they got out there on, on, that, on the road. Yeah, on the road. <laughs> and they got out there on the desert and uh, towards uh, Yuma, and out in there. And uh, they were hungry, and uh, they would uh, they would hunt a little bit and catch a rabbit now and then. Uh -huh. But uh, they were really down one day, and so they said, "Well, what are we yelling about? Let's go get us some food." And they went out and caught two or three big old rattlers, <laughs> and <laughs> cut them up and, and barbecued them and said, "Best meat they ever ate." <laughs> And you know, rattlesnake meat is very white meat, very sweet. 
Well, they came across the Yuma, yeah. Yuma Dunes. Yes, oh yeah. Uh, that, was that a quarter railroad at the time? Yeah, well, no, no, they didn't have much oh. of anything there. They just had to kind of wind their way around there. Now, oh, I can. Geez. I went over the Cordero Road. Uh, what was your right back, Yeah. Uh, no, no. Uh, on the trip out, on, how, yeah. Okay, how did you get here? On oh, well, I came with mother, and we came on the train. Oh, okay. Yeah, we went up. Okay. They went up to. I can't recall now whether they went into the Phoenix area, but uh, up that way, and the train came uh, through, and they caught the train came out. And I've got some pictures of me and mother uh, about that age, and about that time that happened. Tell, tell me about. Uh, do you remember your your grandfather at all? Um. No, I never knew my grand that on my father's side. No, yeah. I never knew him. Uh, he passed away. As a matter of fact, uh, that was a very interesting story. Uh, my grandfather, uh, William Button Camp, uh, was a very fine uh, a craftsman. He was a sailmaker. He was a weaver. Uh, we still have, I think, a little sample of weaving someplace. I don't know whether I've lost it or not to somebody I don't know, but I've got a picture of it. Uh, that they did when they were in England. The family were weavers, hmm. and he was a sailmaker, and he was a, a, a naval uh, man. And interestingly enough, he uh, worked on the St. George Temple uh, for uh, all the time that it was in building, uh -huh. and then uh, they couldn't afford to put a roof on the St. George Temple, so he said, I'll make a roof out of sailcloth, if you can find it, the cloth. And so they did, and uh, he hand stitched the entire temporary roof for the St. George Temple and he put it um, put it on installed it and then they got him some tar and of course they just plain old melted tar and they began mopping that in gradually every day and uh, he worked so hard it was during the summertime to get that finished that he got a heat stroke and that killed him uh, and, uh, at that time but he was a very accomplished musician also. He led the choir, oh, he uh, the uh, fine singing voice, uh -huh. and he led the choir there in St. George for years when they lived there. Uh, he made a clock that uh, still operates over in the, uh, in the um, uh, what do they call it? The, it's, it's like a big meeting house there. Uh, oh, the... Um Tabernacle? Tabernacle. Yeah. The St. George Tabernacle that still just hangs there and it still runs. In, in a clock? Yeah. Well, I'll have to go look at that. <laughs> I never knew that. <laughs> I, I presume it is still yeah. there years yeah. ago when we were in there. But uh, they they were very instrumental in the group that settled in St. George. And, uh, tell, tell me tell me about tell me about uh, this. This is an uncle, I assume. Yeah, that's Uncle Arthur. Now, write that on there. No, that's Walter. I'm sorry. That's okay. Walter John Kemp. Okay. Did you know him? Yes, I I uh, knew him. Walter was um, looks like a character. Yes, he <laughs> he was. Uh, as a matter of fact, and uh, uh, his uncle Arthur looked very much like him. Uh, but Walter was a um, sort of a footloose and fancy free, and uh, he went up to um, he 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 stayed in the St. George area for a long time. And also Uncle Jim stayed up there, and then he went up into the Salt Lake area and established a big farm down at what is now Sandy, mm -hmm. right along the old main boulevard, 89. He was on right? both sides of the roads there uh, for years. And we, when we went up there in 1925, drove a uh, Model T touring car from San Diego, Marvin, my brother and I, and mother and dad, drove a 19, uh, it was a 1921 uh, Model T Ford touring car. And we drove it clear to Salt Lake. <laughs> Seven days traveling time, not counting two days, we had to stay over in, in Mesquite, Nevada to replace a broken axle. Uh -huh. And maybe, maybe you think that wasn't the experience. <laughs> and no roads to mount anything. Well, he has, a, he has a cross pinned on his lapel. Yeah. Is that of any significance? Not, not really. Just decoration. Just that's right. He was just uh, <laughs> that was him. <laughs> that's great. That was typical of him, I think. But now, now Uncle um, Uncle Jim had an interesting life. Also, in the early days, uh, in in uh, there, as he became, he got married and uh, established this big uh, farm he first took that up that land uh, down in sandy why he um he drove 
freight wagons from Salt Lake to Los Angeles. A big old double wagon with, uh, with about uh, uh, eight span of mules, or six, uh, four span of mules, that would be eight mules, and two big high-wheeled wagons that would, uh, you know, hold up in the sand in the, in the uh, open country. And uh, on the back of the two wagons, they would have a, a big water tank that they carried their water. And he would drive that in a round trip uh, from there, and uh, it took them uh, generally about two to three weeks, and carry freight into Los Angeles, and he'd load up with uh, manufactured goods out of Los Angeles and take them back to Salt Lake uh -huh. in a fair trade. Uh -huh. And so he was a hardy old soul. This is the late 1800s. Yes, late 1800s, uh -huh. uh, before the turn of the century, well, you know, now your dad, mm -hmm. your dad worked on the L.A. or not the L.A. the Salt Lake Temple. He, didn't he you? also did. That's right. He uh, for a little while after he had uh, sort of broken in and, and actually almost learned the uh, stonemason trade at St. George. Uh -huh. Then uh, when he left home, he went to Salt Lake and he was uh, about 16, yeah, uh, 16, 17, maybe uh -huh. right in that area, uh -huh. and worked for um, quite a little while on the Salt Lake Temple as well while they were finishing up there. And then he uh, he decided that that wasn't for him, so that's when he went down there. Uh, Dur during that time in Salt Lake, apparently he <laughs> knew of or personally knew uh, Porter Rockwell. Oh, I'm sure. That was one of his heroes, uh, Porter Rockwell was. And I think he had uh, indeed met him. Uh -huh. uh, I, I'm not sure the timing. Uh, well, the, ti the timing yeah. would have been probably yeah. right for him. But he, uh, he, he, he really was a fan of Porter yeah. Rockwell because he was a typical uh, Western hero, so to speak. Yeah. He was a kind of a scallywag in many ways. Uh, he didn't uh, pay too much attention, but he saved the, prof the prophet's life a yeah. time or two, and, uh, and he could be depended on, and he was a great hand with the Indians. Yeah. He could just uh, deal with them, deal with them <laughs> on their level, you know. And, uh, and that, and he even spoke uh, much of their language. And your dad's, mm -hmm. your dad's association, or at least admiration of him, led yeah. to... Oh, yes, naming my brother Rockwell. Rockwell, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. <laughs> I, 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 just you, older than I. You know, because I didn't, I didn't, you know, your father was uh, long gone before yeah. I was born, but uh, I remember Grandma real well, because she yeah. lived with us on occasion, as I remember, didn't she? she yes. Or uh, stayed with us? On that tape, tape that Stephen has. Yeah. Is one of the best. Pictures of Grandma. Oh, okay, I was hoping because yes. the one we had in there only had a small. Right. Small well, it, it, it was down at the Rockies, oh, good. Um, and it was they had she we had built the little apartment of right. Rockies, and okay. you had you and Steve were with us, and uh, you had that little uh, alligator that oh yeah snapped oh, these jaws that. that way like this. Oh yeah. And okay. you were running around scaring Grandma. Oh, okay, <laughs> I remember that. I remember. Well, she used to tell us marvelous stories. Oh yeah. Uh, when she lived with us, and and the one that I remember. Um, probably most dramatically is the one that when she was a, a little girl mm -hmm. as, as a part of that group that was oh yeah she was 13. 13. Oh, she, okay she I was 13 she was. and that was when her father uh, George H. Brimhall uh -huh. uh, not George H. I'm sorry uh, Noah 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 George H. was a, an uncle, uncle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Noah um, and his company, uh -huh. and he was one of the leaders uh -huh. of that. Now, he never did get the proper credit on the articles on that. But <laughs> anyway, at any rate, they were they were asked by Brigham Young to go down into uh, settle the Little Colorado River in Arizona, and uh, which they they did. But in the process, they had to cross the Colorado, and uh, in that, why uh, they they uh, they came to the ferry. Uh, that was across there, and he wouldn't. Let me Lee's Ferry. Lee's, Lee's Ferry, Ferry. Okay. and he wouldn't take the ferry out because uh -huh. there was um, it was freezing. It was right, and there was ice on the river, uh -huh. uh, chunks of ice coming. Uh -huh. He was afraid it would hold his ferry and put him uh -huh. out of business. Yeah. So he said, "No, no way." And so they waited about uh, two or three days, and they were running out of fodder for the, uh, the cattle and the horses and one thing or another that they brought down. And so they got together and discussed it and said, well, we'll wait one more day and pray about it, and uh, if we uh, don't, we'll build some rafts and we'll go back and pick up some timber and come down and build rafts and take ourselves across. Well, uh, they watched all night, and at, uh, by about 3 o'clock in the morning, the, the river began to freeze over. Did they have a prayer circle? Is yes, she told me about you that? bet. Yeah. yeah. The river began to freeze over. 
<laughs> and by uh, 4.30, they uh, went out with poles and checked the ice. Uh -huh. And they said, it looks good. And so they uh, went back and got a little sand and put a little trail out over the ice. <laughs> and they had a, a, an old cow that was a kind of the leader uh -huh. of the stock. She, they follow her and they led her across and the stock followed. And then they, uh, they said, okay, we're gonna go. And so all the children took everything they could out of the wagons and uh, turned the tables upside down and scooted one another across the ice across the river, got on the other side, I think it was 11 wagons if I'm not mistaken are in that number, uh -huh. and uh, as the last wagon, front wheels came up on the bank on the far side, the very last wagon, the back wheels broke through the ice, in five minutes there was no ice in sight. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Now talk about the mirror. Uh, uh, she, was, she was actually riding in a covered wagon. Yeah, uh, exactly. To colonize each Arizona. Mm -hmm. Had that spiritual experience. And they went down and established that colony on the Little Colorado that was very difficult because every time they put a dam in, <coughs> it would flood and knock the dam out. <laughs> and, and then they set up a, 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 a shared program. Everybody was equal. They shared everything, yeah. you know. United Order, uh, actually. Uh, and it was very successful for a long time. And they finally did establish themselves there quite well. But then they began to spread out. And... Uh, and uh, Father Brim Hall, Grandfather Brim Hall, and then there's when he came down into uh, the Phoenix area. And, uh, oh, and oh yeah, there. right. <coughs> and, and, and of course, a lot of the Brim yeah. Halls, oh, that huge family, oh, came yeah. out of the Phoenix Mesa exactly. area. Phoenix -Mesa yeah. area uh -huh. Exactly, Phoenix Mesa area in there. And uh, uh, Grandfather was a very interesting thing. Uh, the tales about him, of course, is rem are remarkable because he was born at a time. On the raft. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, he was born just, before. yeah, well, he was born way up in the uh, Monongahela River where his, his father uh -huh. operated a sawmill uh -huh. up in there right. and made shingles and t lint timber. And so they wanted to get out of there. It was a remote and very frigid area. And, and so he said, okay, we'll build, a, we'll build an ark. <laughs> and uh, so they, he built out of his own timber and they built this big uh, barge, if you uh -huh. want to call it that. And, uh, then on the deck, he built three little huts out of bundles of shingles huh. to live in. And uh, so he had, there are several boys. There must have uh, six or seven boys. Uh -huh. And uh, they all embarked on the lot. And then grandfather had just been born, born shortly, and they named him Noah because it was when boy on board the ark. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I, I remember Grandma telling us a story yeah. about uh, your father, Grandpa, mm -hmm. uh, kicking a bear. Oh, that <laughs> yeah, that was a true story. He was, uh, when, when he was just a young, young man. Was, uh, he, was he married? Uh, no, was no, he was uh, that, that was before he was okay. married. Yeah, he was out looking for the cattle, uh, yeah. some cattle, and uh, he was supposed to have gone to get, to get them earlier, and uh, he uh, was almost dark, or just uh -huh. about dusk yeah. and dark, and he finally spotted this black spot and he thought well that's my black that's our black cow I'll go down and get him <laughs> get it get her and uh, so he walks down around this little swale in the sort of a little meadow and by a big rock there and uh, he went over and he he uh, he thought it was a cow laying down there so he went over and kicked her and it turned out to be a big old black bear <laughs> <laughs> the bear went one way, the bear went one way, and I went the other. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's a mess. Well, when, when you were, uh, <laughs> when you were a young man, you were the youngest of sixteen. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, you must have been pretty spoiled. <laughs> yes. As a matter of fact, my three older sisters that were home literally raised me. Uh, they were, they were, that's uh, Opal and Ruth particularly, and Leah when she was home for a while there. And uh, even Dora uh, had a share in that, but uh, Dora married early on. She married uh, a man by the name of Oliver Fletcher, who was... She was about 18, wasn't yes, she? Yes, right. She was very young. Uh, Oliver was a great guy. He never, never was in, joined the church or anything like that, but he, I can remember when I was just a kid, and he would never come to our house as we, Marvin Rock and I were just kids, and, and he would never come to our house except he had some.
some kind of a toy, a baseball bat or a ball or a glove or something or other, and then he'd get out and play with us. And uh, he was a great mechanic. Uh, he, he, in the early, early automobiles, early on, he was also a motorcycle rider in those early days, and he got himself it, busted up. Or did he, is, is he the one that got all your brothers into motorcycle racing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then when he got busted up, did yeah, he give it up or yeah, something? Yeah, that I did too. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I rode for quite a long time. Uh, if one, is that he the one that went through the windshield? Or yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. Broke his leg in about seven yeah. places or something. Mm -hmm. But he he turned out to be one of the finest mechanics uh, in the whole San Diego area. As a matter of fact, he worked over on North Island, and uh, these officers uh, and the uh, Air Corps. Uh, would uh, wangle a, a way to get into the Navy or the base down there just to bring their car down to have him, I mean, we're gonna have him <laughs> tune up there. He, he was a carburetor specialist oh, and he would send them so they get the best mileage and best performance, you know, and rebuild them and all that type of thing. Well, this little uh, <laughs> Fautler, Lord Fauntleroy picture here oh. <laughs> looks like you're kind of ticked off at somebody. Huh? <laughs> I, I probably was to get my self dressed, dressed up, like up gussied up, and so on. That's about the last time. I was about, uh, what, I'm kind of remember. It says uh, about 1915. 1915, yeah. so you see that? We're about seven years old. I wouldn't be too old there. I, so, I, no, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't reached eight yet. Did, uh, mm -hmm. uh, this was in San Diego. Oh, yeah, yeah you had been in San yeah. Diego. Mm -hmm. uh, right. uh, I, I remember you telling me some stories about, about some of your work in San Diego. And, and somebody had mentioned something about a flood and something to your family oh, did. Oh, gosh. Or, uh, uh, that that residence that we were in uh -huh. in San Diego, the first one we had, uh, Dad bought that house, by the way, uh, uh -huh. after renting it for a while, and it was very very comfortable and uh, and big enough for the family. But we were right near the uh, the Bay Area uh, that came out of the San Diego Bay and and went down towards Chula Vista and uh -huh. down through there. See, and then you had to keep the strand and come clear back to go over to Coronado if you wanted to there, almost into Mexico. Yeah. And uh, that area uh, it was uh, flood prone. And so in 19, um, around 1915, not uh -huh. too far from there, uh -huh. why uh, uh, I can recall going down there with the kids and the folks and one thing or another, and it washed about uh, eight or 10 homes that were on that area, washed them right out into the bay. Huh. And the railroad track ran across there also in that uh, shortcutted in that area and it washed everything out from under the railroad tracks and the only thing that was holding them up the 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 rails were fastened to the ties uh -huh, see? Uh -huh. and here was a big stretch and so I, I remember our, uh, some of the older kids walking out on that thing oh. out over this ri rushing river oh, coming God. down through there <laughs> and then uh, shortly after that then we moved uh, from there up to the uh, northeast part of town which was the east part of town uh, just over the uh, the valley, you well, know, the big uh, uh, valley that comes down. Mission Valley. Mission Valley, yeah. yeah. Did, uh, uh, somebody had mentioned that some of your brothers had done some rescue work or something during that flood. They, the older boys, the as older a matter of fact, were involved. Well, see, by 1918, uh, Omar and Carol were, and uh, Heber were all in the service. The army, yeah. So they were well along uh -huh. in years, you know. And we had a lot of service people in our home with yeah. uh, three girls yeah. were available. <laughs> and uh, Interesting story there, Opal, uh, uh, the young, being the younger of those, and we lived right across the uh, street from a huge uh, Chinese truck farm oh, uh -huh. that was owned by some very fine Chinese people. Uh -huh. We used to buy vegetables and everything for literally nothing uh -huh. over there because we just walked across the street, you know. But anyway, the, the, the son of the owner fell in love with my sister Opal. <laughs> and I'm telling you, he besieged her with presents and flowers and invitations and one thing and another. Did you get a lot of vegetables? Or yeah, oh, I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it was quite a comical in the fact, well, of course, she didn't want to, you know, have anything to do with it. But about that time, then, uh, uh, her husband, Bill Millar, came into the picture. Now, he was in the Navy. He was in the Navy yeah, okay. in San Diego. Yeah. And that's where they met. Art Klinger, Ruth's uh -huh. uh, husband, was in the Navy oh, there. Okay. He was a, an officer. Uh -huh. A lieutenant, uh, the first lieutenant uh, in the uh, service, and um, uh, that's how they met then at that time. And then uh, uh, Heber then was married about that time, just, just before. Yeah, he was. He was. 
I can't remember whether it was Martin just before he went into service or just after he got out, but anyway, early yeah. times there. So we had them all, and they all went through, what well, we all did in the family, went through that 1918 scare for um, flu. Flu. Yeah. Oh boy, it killed a lot of people. Killed a lot of people. Oh, now, you didn't, your family didn't lose anybody. No, and, but they were all, everybody was sick in the family but Dad. Uh, and he took care of all of them. <laughs> everybody. He, well, I didn't have it very well, but I can remember him helping him go around and uh -huh. hold the uh, dishes for him and one thing or another like because I, I wasn't affected by it yeah, a good deal. Yeah. And that yeah. was nineteen eighteen, you see, so I would have been ten. Ten, uh, uh -huh. ten years old. Uh, now your brothers of course I mm -hmm. you know, I remember them probably better than the si your sisters. Oh yes, I'm sure because because they said. were all married and we didn't yeah. get to see them like but yeah. now Rock and Marv of but, but I remember uh mm -hmm. Dan and Eve and oh, Dave yes. yeah. and those folks. Um mm -hmm. And I remember, uh, see, my, my impression as a youngster was that your your uh, brothers were all doing interesting things. Yes, they they were <laughs> they were as a matter of fact. Uh, yeah. Now, <clears throat> as an example, uh, let's take Leif for example. He worked for the uh, San Diego Electric and Power Company uh -huh. there, uh, gas and gas and electric, and uh, he. Uh, drove the big equipment truck and they'd go out and repair lines, you know, that yeah. type of thing. He was a, a supervisor, I guess you'd call it. He also drove the truck. Uh, but he um, he was a very, very accomplished um, mechanic with, with everything. He was just a natural mechanic and could repair or do anything, as Oliver was, yeah, for instance. Yeah. But uh, he, uh, he married out of the church and uh, although she never was antagonistic at all. She never was helpful either. Yeah, neither was yeah. he well. And so, uh, but he, he was a great guy, a great jokester, just loved a good time. He just, <laughs> and then the Heber, now, now that was, that, that, that was Leif. Leif. Now, now, now Leif stands for? Lafayette. Yeah. Uh, did he take a lot of kidding about that name? Uh, or did most people accept him as Leif by then? Yeah, Leif by then. Yeah, that's so. right. Now Lafayette comes, interestingly enough, from a family name, yeah. family situation, uh -huh. because um, my grandfather Noah uh -huh. married a nurse uh -huh. whose father, you two, uh -huh. was a personal physician for Lafayette. And so that's where the name and that's how the name got down. Okay. That's, interesting. That's, interesting. that's that's really interesting. Well, how about how about how about your middle name and my middle middle name? Where well, that I I I well, just don't. No, for sure, but yeah. I think that the, the family was through reason. mother somehow uh -huh. that that uh -huh. name came. Now that's your mother's yeah. lineage comes through. Uh, that's the Brimhall. Uh, Brimhall yeah. and then Jones, oh, which yes. is Welsh. Welsh. Yeah, okay. And it could have come, could have come from someplace there. Yeah. I'm not really sure, but I, I suspect so. I remember Carol, probably, yeah. because he was, the, the younger brothers, I remember, yes. more. And then, of course, Carol Opal, and Omer, oh, oh, yeah. and Omer and Opal. I, I remember yeah. the brothers Opal. really well. Yeah. Yeah. But and Carol was... Uh, uh, all his life was a shoemaker, and he he oh, he worked on uh, North Island there in the station. I used to go over and work with him a lot over there. As a matter of fact, when he had a shoe store down in on, on Wilcox, Arizona, across the oh, yeah. Grand Mountain, sure. And I went down there and worked for him all summer. We got trips for awesome money, and uh, I was a big old husky kid, you know. I had a lot of people come into the store and uh, say, "Carol, what do you think of this?" And and they. <laughs> they thought that they were seeing Carolyn. Oh, oh, I see. <laughs> and uh, we, I stayed all summer. We used to laugh about it. We'd I'll go home for lunch and, and we'd laugh about it. But anyway, then he came back. To, after that, he came back and got that franchise at North Island and had a very success. He sold shoes uh, to the, and repaired shoes for the service man. Uh -huh. And uh, that's where I find uh, my first airplane flight came. One of the pilots there showed me aboard a PBY. Oh, is that right? <laughs> I'll be back to him on those big old those uh, flying boats. Those boats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they weren't supposed to do that, but uh, I bugged them so much that <laughs> <laughs> as pilots I got acquainted with them. And then, uh, of course, at that time, uh, a little after that, then our cleaner began working there. He uh, he was a very fine